good evening ladies and gentlemen we extend our warm welcome to everyone to this founder stay lecture organized by the metas institute of development studies as it happens this is the 15th founder stay lecture at mids the mids chairperson shri n gopalaswami will chair and preside over this special event may i now invite our chairperson to initiate the proceedings thank you um, professor uh... Sogato Marjit, Professor Babu, distinguished uh, members attending this uh, Founders Day lecture, and friends. Um, today is the 112th year of uh, 12th birth anniversary of uh, Professor uh, Malcolm Adi Seshaya, a very distinguished educationist. and uh, a person who strode the educational field uh, in various capacities uh, contributing to uh, education not only really within india but uh, uh, in his chosen madras university as the uh, vice chancellor at one point of time but his contribution to the world stage in unesco for over 22 years which uh, we he successfully brought in many changes many uh, uh, new programs finding the funds from all over the world and uh, initiating what to his heart was most um, most near and important that is education and uh, the the uh, number of institutions within india and outside who have received his um, uh, because of his association who received funds and uh, did extremely well as legion in fact um, uh, it's a little difficult to count in detail but let me mention uh, one or two institutions one is iit bombay the other is iit karakpur the ncert and um, uh, many other institutions um, also uh, the man was distinguished from this point of view that he cared for two things one tamil the other one was his native uh, tongue and the other was the indian uh, uh, art and cultural scene so he had um, uh, it's it's very interesting how he organized the uh, tamil conference in uh, paris and uh, he was also in, uh, he was also known to speak in uh, tamil english also uh, adding tamil to the to the uh, list of languages uh, which shows uh, his uh, great affinity to his mother tongue and um, uh, more especially the the fact that he could uh, influence policy he was also a member of parliament and uh, stood up to um, to uh, better education within the country uh, always willing to speak his mind uh, irrespective of uh, what the others uh, thought of a very very distinguished um, educationist and he set up the uh, madras institute of uh, development studies uh, this is the 50th uh, anniversary year for us uh, an institution which uh, uh, which to his mind was necessary to to have a very in depth study of economics the poverty and other related issues uh, in tamil nadu in south india and in india in general uh, we have um, uh, we had this this association with the institution for until about 1996 or so and uh, uh, this institution in 50 years has grown but at the same time i i would say grown we could have grown much uh, more uh, that's that's for another day to find out why why and uh, uh, what we can do for it but today we are having uh, professor subhata subhata uh, marajit who will be uh, delivering us a very interesting talk on um, gender discrimination competition and efficiency uh, professor sugata uh, marjit will be introduced to you separately but um, he is today the uh, distinguished professor in uh, indian institute of foreign trade in uh, in delhi uh, with a uh, have been has been a vice chancellor of, uh, of calcutta university a very distinguished um, educationist himself and uh, we are looking forward to his uh, oration today in uh, memory of uh, our founder Uh, Professor S. Mark Mesadi Seshaya. Over to uh, uh, 
to the uh, to introducing the uh, uh, to the speaker and then to the speaker's oration. Uh, uh, the Founders' Day lecture, instituted by the Malcolm and Elizabeth Odisha Shared Trust and administered by MIDS since 2004, is a grateful acknowledgement of the vision of MIDS founder, Dr. Malcolm Adhisheshaya. Since his time, MIDS has followed a broad and inclusive research tradition, one that accommodates differing perspectives and methodologies. It is our hope that this will help to focus attention on those concerns of development and well-being, which are so integral an aspect of MIDS research agenda. We plan to make up for the pandemic-induced lockdown period with special Founders Day lectures uh, to mark the golden jubilee of MIDS. The first of this will be delivered in a few minutes by Professor Sagata Majid, who currently is the first distinguished professor of the Indian Institute of Foreign Trade. He's a former vice chancellor of Calcutta University, chairman of the West Bengal State Council of Higher Education, RBI chair, professor and director at the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, what we call CSSS in Calcutta. He also held the first Sukhumai Chakravarti Chair Professorship at uh, the Center for Economic Studies and Planning at JNU Delhi. Prior to that, he taught at the prestigious Presidency College, then Jadapur University and Indian Statistical Institute, Calcutta. Uh, Professor Majid has held visiting professorial positions at uh, all the top universities in Europe, Hong Kong, Japan, USA, and Australia. He is the recipient of the Mahanobis Gold Medal of the Indian Econometric Society and the BKRB Rao National Prize for a Young Social Scientist, one of the very few to receive both of these uh, prizes. He's also a recipient of the Global Development Network Best Research Paper Award uh, instituted by the World Bank. He is a university-wide distinguished visiting fellow of Queen Mary University of London in 2018 and university-wide rector awarded senior research fellow of University of Dresden in 2022. He is the editor in chief of the South Asian Journal of Macroeconomics and Public Finance, uh, which is being published now by Sage. He has published widely in uh, reputed journals, including the top ones such as American Economic Review, Journal of Economic Theory, Journal of International Economics, European Economic Review, G Journal of Development Economics, Nature, Climate Change, and also Indian Journal of Physics, to mention a few. His monographs and edited volumes have been published by Oxford University Press, Cambridge University Press, and Springer Nature. Uh, Professor Majid is a truly multidimensional personality. He is an accomplished Hindustani vocalist specializing in coil. He was trained by a disciple of Pandit Vinayak Rao Patwadhan when he was in grade seven, and subsequently received training from late Sri K.C. Banerjee Pandit, uh, and uh, Janorikar of Bendi Bazar Garana. He has performed in hundreds of concerts all around the world. The highlights being uh, the famous Sangit Mochan Sangit Festival of Varanasi, one of the oldest festivals in India. The National Center for Performing Arts of Bombay, ITC Sangit Research Academy concert, and the 50th year of India's independence concert hosted by the Upper House of Parliament in Delhi, to name a few. In uh, the Founders Day lecture today, entitled Gender Discrimination, Competition and Efficiency, Professor Majid questions the accepted wisdom that gender discrimination will not survive competitive market forces. Knowing him, I am sure you all can anticipate an exciting twist in his tale. Before I give the floor to him, let me thank Professor Majid for accepting our request, despite limited preparatory time, as well as our chairman, Sri N. Gopalaswamy for chairing this special event. We record our gratitude to the Malcolm and Elizabeth Adhisheshaya Trust for their continuing support of this important uh, Founders Day lecture series, which is one of the most important event in our academic calendar. Uh, over to you, Professor Majid. Thank you. I hope uh, all of you can listen I and mean, hear my voice. Uh, we are not very uh, competent to handle the technology, so sometimes uh, if there is any problem, please use your sign language that, that there is something wrong or I, should, I will go on, you know, speaking. Uh, uh, respected uh, Mr. Gopala Swami, uh, uh, um, the director and friend, uh, Professor P.G. Babu, 
the distinguished guests and, and uh, uh, those who are listening to my talk today. It is uh, a rare privilege for me to uh, present my uh, oration today here at the uh, MIDS. Uh, because I am presenting on the occasion of the Founders Day, and the founder being a very rare intellectual philanthropist, educationist, and institution builder, none other than uh, Dr. Malcolm Adisa Shaiva. Uh, in a way, this presentation is a tribute to this glorious intellectual and contributor of or a nation builder. And we all know that what the India that we see today uh, has been made of the contributions of great people, great visionaries, and public assets such as the MIDS make us proud and with its enlightening impression on the society. Even in days when liabilities and challenges are facing this great nation. And today I'm going to talk about a liability uh, that has been disappointing for us and the world at large for ages. And this has to do with discrimination. Problem of discrimination, you know, I am, I'll be moving back and forth between my own uh, improvisation and the draft of the lecture, which I guess has been already circulated. Uh, so uh, the structure of my, my speech would be based on this, this sequence, the way I have developed in the, in the draft of the lecture. So this problem of discrimination has been a favorite topic of engagement in various disciplines as variety of discriminatory practices have been in vogue across space and time. I mean, we know that discriminations or discrimination as a practice can be varied. It can affect us, the society, in various domains and takes various forms and shapes. Um, you know, the Discrimination in any form is quite derogatory and is a vice with which the world has lived for too long. Yet such practices are created and often justified to perpetuate them. So basically, they, you know, this type of remark that, you know, what I'm making that if you observe discrimination and people start talking about it, criticizing it, then there are also certain quarters which would try to see, you know, to interpret this as a social mechanism, which is kind of automatic, cannot be avoided, or, you know, should not be criticized that much because this is what we are and so on and so forth. So several authors have reflected, analyzed this issue of gender-related discrimination in terms of various dimensions, such as social, political, economic. Although all of them could be classified as some form of social discrimination, the logic and mechanisms of such practices are never mutually exclusive. And still it makes sense to classify them in different categories. So, Discrimination has a very common kind of a structure. You know, it's a, basically, it's, it's a kind of disrespect to humans by humans. So, and, 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 the, and this type of disrespect, this type of demeaning uh, sort of behavior by the humans against humans are reflected in various domains. So, in a way, the discrimination as a practice contains 
elements which are very common across such practices. Yet it is important that we classify them for analytical purposes, for explaining things or for understanding the issues better, we divide them into classifications, proper classifications. For example, missing women or missing girl children are kinds of the outcomes from, of discrimination which have been talked about extensively in the literature. Sometimes people argue that there are solid economic reasons or certain factors which, can, which we can touch and feel about all this. And in some, some cases, you will find that it is kind of social perception or elements which are caused by social perception or evolutions without much uh, concern about materialism, this, without much concern about monetary issues or income or employment. You know, there are certain very core sociological problems. So perceived inferiority of women as a race in a male dominated society impart such a view to generations in a rare mix of genetics and social you know this point that you know because i this type of research is new to me i have been i have been following this in the context of education policies but i feel that any kind of social prejudice with which we are affected at a particular point of time in particular in this context of uh, you know, of, of prejudices uh, rampant in a male dominated society. Uh, you know, the, the problem remains, you know, the problem is, an, is a part of this evolution, which is, you know, sort of inherited from the past through intergenerational bequests in some sense. Something that is ingrained, you know, within us, which I call genetics and the sociology of it, that the society we live in, the social evolution itself, you know, so basically the problem of designing policies to control discrimination are remarkable in the sense that they have to fight with history. They have to fight with the past. They have to fight with lots of things which they cannot control. Now. So that part of that part of the, the issue remains quite important and sometimes is very insensitive to the regulatory policies. So analytically, we can differentiate two components explaining any theory of discrimination. The first component is largely beyond control. Now, the problem is that in economics as a discipline, we sometimes feel that we need to explain everything under the sun. And there, is, there, are bounds of, there are bounds of rationality as we observe. And I'm not saying that rationality has bounds, but the bounds of rationality are reflected in the fact that you need to study history, uh, social evolution, politics, very carefully before you can make a deterministic conclusion. And therefore, there are certain aspects of a theory of discrimination, which we should take as given. That is, these problems are looking at us on your face, on our face, in a way that we cannot do anything with these perceptions. But what we can do is the second part of theorization. That is, can we design policies so that those policies impact our negative instincts in a way, sort of incentivize the system in a way, so that we do not undertake harmful actions as far as discrimination is concerned. So example. Suppose I have inherited this belief that male workers are more productive than female workers. Hence, I would like to reward male workers more than the female. Even if 
there is either no evidence of productivity difference or I don't care about such evidence. So in that case, what happens is that a policy or a, a system can guarantee whether or it should guarantee that such an action on my part would actually affect my self-interest. So if I would like to pay higher wages to the male workers, then I would be losing on something. And therefore, there are certain uh, tangible losses that I have to care for. And so I cannot undertake the action that would affect my profits, income, or whatever. Now, I'll come back to this, uh, this idea of theorization later in my talk, because uh, when I talk about, uh, you know, uh, about there is a sort of a uh, utilitarian uh, kind of divide or trade-offs between my prejudices, my convictions, my, my commitments, which uh, deny any kind of rational explanation and the role of uh, me as a maximizing individual. So, so there is this duality that exists in the nature of people. And therefore, uh, as, as economists, we try to look for some kind of rational coexistence of this uh, of this dual, of, of this uh, uh, trade off or or you know two sides of this duality so we'll come back come back to that so in this uh, essay or the, this lecture or paper whatever it is i shall try to focus on whether discriminatory practices in a competitive market are sustainable or not sustainable that is, if there is a market which is satisfying certain basic competitive conditions, then whether discrimination between male and female workers in some form, whether that type of discrimination is sustainable. And, and why I am doing this? Because this is uh, the labor market context or the context of the labor market in the discrimination theory of discrimination is the main point of focus in, in empirically uh, you know labor market behavior in economics because it's a, the reflection of discrimination is felt on the performance of wages employment etc in the labor market uh, you know across uh, genders and so on so basically that is there i'm not going to talk about the survey of the literature and so on because that's there in the in the draft, which which uh, I think uh, you know there have been it has been circulated to all of you. And and what I shall focus mostly on the basic storyline of my argument, and the basic background of my argument, and and the simple analytical model, which uh, uh, does not require a very specialized knowledge of economics, uh, but. Uh, with which I can explain my my observations or my conclusions uh, in a very simple way. So, so that is basically the structure. So there are several aspects of discrimination that I discuss in this uh, in in this paper. And and if anyone is interested to pursue. Uh, any kind of extensions of these ideas, you know, I have, uh, you know, given a, a large number of references where people can take off from there. So those things are for those who are specialized readers or who are interested in this in this topic. Okay, so basically, gender discrimination is considered a close follow up of racial discrimination in economics. The reason is historical. Why? Because mainstream economics has flourished mostly in the Anglo-Saxon world or in the Western world, particularly earlier in UK and then in US, Europe, and so on, where the racial discrimination 
is a very important political issue, social issue, and so on. So the discrimination, anything that is there between discrimination and labor market repercussions, economists have often focused on racial discrimination, though gender discrimination has actually, you know, has emerged as, as a, a very modern or, or, or postmodern um, manifestation of, of literature discrimination, and in fact is is, is surpassing in some ways this uh, racial discrimination debate right now. So this uh, problem of discrimination, therefore, was uh, embedded in racial discrimination, and economists economists took that examples to to clarify, you know, build up their models, analytical structures, empirical exercises, and so on and so forth. And two persons very very, very famous and, and very important personalities in modern economics, Gary Baker of Chicago and Kenneth Arrow of, of uh, ex Stanford and Harvard. Uh, and both of them are no longer with us, but both of them are Nobel laureates and they have contributed significantly in mainstream economics. Uh, and uh, Arrow has a paper in 1998, which summarizes his RD works and works of others theoretical work on relationship between competition and gender discrimination, starting with Baker's original, uh, very authoritative book uh, in 1957. The basic point was that if you follow discrimination, then you would be increasing your cost of production and being a competitive supplier, you know, other competitive suppliers are not going to do it. So you are going to reduce, you are going to increase your cost of production and reduce your profits. And therefore, you are not going to be doing it. And in fact, you'd be outcompeted and you have to leave business. So basically, the idea is that if I, you know, you know, this idea could be explained in many ways, but but let me try to explain it the the, the simplest arithmetic kind of a, or arithmetical way. So essentially, suppose, you know, you know, there are female workers, male workers, previously, both of them were getting 10 rupees each. And frankly speaking, for our understanding of the problem, we will suppose that they are equally productive. Now, there is a reason, because in a very recent paper in 2017, uh, two very well known labor economists, uh, both of them are in Cornell, they have a very extensive paper in Journal of Economic Literature, a mega paper in which they empirically try to assess whether male female wage gap in the US is caused by discrimination or not. So typically the analysis has to be uh, modeled in the following way, that you look at the observed male female wage gap, you know, there is a wage gap. Then you try to adjust that discounting for, you know, productivity differences, you know, maybe the average male wage is greater than average female wage because the way the average is taken uh, from, from industries where the male wage are more efficient than the female and so on. Then there is this question of human capital accumulation, male are more educated than female and so on. But in spite of bringing in all kinds of factors which can differentiate these two types of workers, they conclude that there is a non-trivial extent of gap which is not explained by economic factors. So the question is that if we take the example of similarly productive male female workers, each getting 10 rupees per hour, you know, and the world was very nice, you know, unbiased, free of prejudices, and the world was moving on. One fine morning, the producers or one producer, you know, is stuck or is sort of is struck by this kind of stupidity that they are, they must be, you know, female must be inferior to male. And what they do, what he does, he doesn't reduce female workers wage, he increases male workers wage by two rupees. Immediately what it does, it increases average cost of production. So if he was selling this product, let's say very close to 12 rupees, you know, let's say, not 12 rupees, 22 rupees, let's suppose one female and uh, 20 rupees, one female and one male, 10 rupees each, so it's 20 rupees. 
and it is competitive producer. So, so the price should be pretty close to this 20 rupees because there's not much a profit there. And know if he pays 22 rupees, then eventually loses money. He, you know, he can't lose and stay in business because, because everybody else can sell at, uh, you know, with their cost as 20, but he'll be forced to sell because near their cost would be 22. The, the problem that is important here is that average cost of production is increasing. Price is following average cost of production because it's a competitive industry. It is also the fact that if I'm doing something wrong, you know, rest of the world, the competitive producers will think that actually, you know, they are not going to raise the, the wage rate of the male workers. So what they observe is that what we should observe is that this chap would lose business. And there was this, you know, various ways of showing that competitive equilibrium for a farm in an industry, you know, cannot allow you to do things beyond reason. It just cannot allow you to increase your cost of production. There was even more of a reason to be worried because in your companies, the bankers, the capitalists, they're financing your production. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not something, uh, you know, a kind of a hearsay or it's, it's not something uh, which is not uh, known to people. That is a large part of the businesses is financed by external finance, the capitalists, the bankers, the financiers and so on. Now, if you cannot pay them the highest rate of return because you are not maintaining a good profit rate, they are not going to invest in your company. So capital will move away from you to other farms within an industry, maybe to other industries. Now, Kenneth Arrow, in several articles he wrote, he, you know, in a way they were trying to explain discrimination. And they were trying to also to bring out what is, what has been a great virtue of competitive capitalism. That is under perfect competition, the system reaches the highest level of welfare. If you, if you forget about distribution, you know, anyone who has done a bit of an economics knows that, that in a competitive equilibrium, you have Pareto optimum, means what? Means that if you can allow perfect competition, then the allocation of resources would be such that you cannot better one individual's position without harming any others. And this point is called the Pareto optimal point. And it is almost, you know, if one call it a very ideal system and therefore uh, it is just uh, utopian, which is fine. But even in the context of discrimination, I think there was this historical effort on the part of the best of the minds to conclude that, you know, it is competition ultimately, like many other, under many other situations that it might take care of this discrimination part, you know, bad thing of this society. Now, that's where I think, you know, my intervention comes in, where I would try to challenge this or modify this. I cannot say that challenging something is, is, is a kind of uh, nomenclature that we are now getting used to uh, in academic uh, domain and corridors challenging, fighting, and, and conflicting, and so on. You know, often aggression is, is taken as a signal of strength. Now that I don't believe in. So the question is, it is essentially a, a, a kind of an engagement, an academic engagement uh, that tells us what are the conditions under which Baker arrow type of propositions would hold good and under what conditions it won't hold good. So the primary, uh, you know, preliminary uh, uh, assumption that I have, which might be quite heroic, but I think that is important, is that I think that everybody, you know, I can assume that every farm 
in an industry. If it's run by an entrepreneur in a male-dominated society, very likely to be a male entrepreneur, then essentially there would be some ingrained prejudices inside. So the question is that to assume that nobody is interested in discrimination, where only one person who struck by the lightning in the morning by waking up takes this action would be too tall an assumption. You know, I would definitely adhere to the same uh, methodology of, of research that these great minds are pursuing, which is that we need to question ourselves that what happens if a competitive firm wishes to engage in discrimination. If every one of them wishes to engage, that is, they would like to engage in such, a, such an act, then is it true that the competitive industry won't survive? Is it true that these firms won't survive? The second assumption that I make is that the farms may be competitive, but they can be heterogeneous. That is, inherently, the farms may have some farm-specific advantages, which I call productivity or efficiency, that lead to heterogeneity among farms. There is a reason why I'm saying this, because the most uh, modern uh, framework of analysis of microeconomic theory and international trade come from uh, farm heterogeneity models, which are the in thing in the international trade literature and so on, which have been discussed in different contexts and, and uh, people have worked uh, extensively in this area, but of course, not dis discussing about you know, discrimination in this context, but what is the char you know, characteristic of farm behavior? You know, if, you, if you observe an industry in the global scene, what you are likely to, to observe? Essentially, you are likely to observe heterogeneous farms and the farms having different productivities, inherently different productivity. Not really that within farm there is separate productivities and efficiencies between male and female workers, but in general. So you can rank the farms according to their level of productivities but none of them is big enough to affect the prices in the market. This is the fundamental assumption of competitive market that you can earn a lot of profit, but you alone do not determine the prices in the market. Now, of course, uh, there are counter examples in terms of even more concentrated market structure, like uh, you know, market for oil, energy, for technology and so on and so forth, sometimes of, of medicines, etc. But there also, I shall, I shall, when I conclude my, my talk, I shall also tell you how this extension goes into those domains as well. So farms are essentially prejudiced to discriminate, and there is a competitive system, and the farms are heterogeneous in terms of productivity. Then what is going to happen in this system? Now, let me, I will very briefly, uh, you know, try to describe the framework and I would be excused because there are social scientists who are not uh, very familiar with mathematical techniques and the mathematics that I'm going to use will be actually supplemented by, by uh, my oral explanations to the best of my ability, which should not confuse anyone. So suppose what we are doing is trying to draw a picture of a competitive industry. There are many farms and individually they cannot affect the market price called P. The farms have different levels of productivity or efficiency and are indexed between two numbers, you know, in a continuum. So if you take a scale between zero and one, so you have infinitely large numbers within scale you know, from 0 0.000, etc. So each point on that scale tells you that this is a farm. This is labeling a farm, a jersey on, on, on the, uh, 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 as a garment on the farm. And this, there is an index called Z, which ranges from zero to one. So you can say, if I say number half, this is the farm with the jersey of half. 
If you say there is a firm three fourth, that's the level of three fourth and so on. Why I'm doing this? Because this is in the continuum. So there are no discreteness in the distribution of the firms. So by definition, they, they, may, be, they may be having different productivities, but by they're very small, so they cannot affect the price. That is one reason. And the other reason is that actually, I think Babu will appreciate this, uh, being a mathematician himself, uh, that, that the idea that you can use differential calculus, integral calculus easily in this method so that you don't have to use discrete mathematics. But that is not the concern of today's lecture because I'm not going to do those things, you know, largely. So what you do is that each, you know, if you look at this number, this is nothing, the output produced by each firm is actually the function of the summation of male workers and female workers. And just a, just a summation. So depending on the, you know, I, I can increase number of workers, does not matter by employing male or female. And both of them will give me the same productivity, but this fund has a productivity level. You know, if Z is, Z is having higher values, then the productivity level is going up. Z is having lower values, that means this low efficiency fund. So from the same amount of labor, this fund is going to get higher level of output. So this is basically, so if I have 10 female, 10 male workers, you know, and forget about this, this is a production function. Then suppose, you know, 10 laborers, you know, 20 laborers give me 20 units of output for this farm. Then a farm which is ranked lower than that, it will give less output, maybe 15. A farm which is higher than that, that will give me more output, maybe 30. So this is how we are trying to rank the farms. So if you do that, then basically what you do, you plot Z on this side and XZ on that side. And then this is an upward rising curve, which means if I increase Z, then I'm also increase the level of output because they are more productive. So then the question is no discrimination scenario to start with. The world is very ideal, welfareistic and so on. In that case, what happens is that everybody gets the same way. There is no other discrimination and people are earning some money. And there, there, each farm is also facing a fixed cost of production. So fixed cost of production is like if you produce or not produce, you have to actually bear that cost. So it is like you have rented a factory and you are producing there, but you have to pay rent. It doesn't matter whether producing something within the factory. Okay, so this is kind of a fixed cost. So if this is a fixed cost, then the farm actually maximizes profit, chooses a certain amount of workers and I'm not going to describe the maximization problem because suppose they could maximize and choose a particular number of workers. Their standard maximization actually rule is a, is a simple maximization principle, which is also very easy to understand. If I hire an extra worker, then this is the, you know, 10 rupees I have to pay. Suppose now I've hired 19 workers, you know, male, uh, half female, half or, or whatever. Then I'm contemplating, should I hire one more worker? I can hire one more worker by paying them a common wage W because there is no discrimination. And if I put that worker into my production function, then I can produce some extra output. And that would be given, given by alpha times X prime L. X prime L is the change in X when I change L. And then I sell that output in the market. So that extra output that I get, I'm getting, maybe two units, three units, whatever. I sell that output with the same price because I cannot change that price. So I sell that, then this becomes my extra revenue and this W becomes my extra cost. If my extra revenue is greater than extra cost, then I go on hiring. If extra revenue is less than extra cost, then I cut back my, my labor. That is basically the idea. So once I do that and I have, a, and I choose my some optimal L and there is some profit that I get. And from this profit, I am not, uh, you know, developing this little mathematics here, you know, as Babu tells me that it's going to be published in review and development and change as, as an invited contribution. There I'll be more, more, you know, clarifying all this, but to, to understand that uh, is not necessary to understand the, 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 the intervention that, that I have in this paper. So a farm, a very sort of a uh, kind of unbiased, uh, they're all unbiased farm in a, in a world with no discrimination, they are maximizing profit and so on. So 
I can draw a picture. This is their profit without fixed cost, and this is the fixed cost. So if I have a productivity here, my profit is greater than is 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 less than the fixed cost. So I cannot survive in the market. If I am here, my profit is greater than the fixed cost. So I will survive in the market. So the conclusion is, under no discrimination, from zero to a point called Z tilde, these number of farms will not be there in the market, even with no discrimination, because they are not good enough to run business. And the better and more efficient farms will run the business. This is the initial equilibrium, so to speak, how the farms are actually decided. Now what happens is, I bring in discrimination. And when I bring in discrimination, let me be very, uh, you know, I would say, uh, kind of very heuristic. I am just saying that one fine morning, every farm wants to pay more to the male worker. Now, people can say that, why do you call, you know, there can be other type of discrimination. They want to hire more, you know, male workers and female workers and so on, or both. I am not going to argue with that, but I'm going to say my, my framework or my analysis takes this single dimensional act of discrimination because I would like to focus on discrimination of one act and its impact in the system. So now what has happened? Male workers are getting more. And for our argument's sake, we shall say that the employment levels are kept unchanged. Now, we can easily alter that kind of an assumption and redo a bit of a mathematics to do that, but we don't want to do that. So suppose that farms were hiring, you know, a farm was hiring 10 female workers, 10 male workers, only the wage level of the male worker has gone. So I am denoting it by a coefficient beta, where beta was equal to one, then there was no discrimination and beta greater than one means there is discrimination. So I would like to know what happens if I go on increasing beta from one to a level greater than one, what happens to the system? Now, common sense will tell you that everybody is doing it because I'm not making one person, one farm responsible for this. I'm, I'm trying to say that this discrimination, idea of discrimination is very widespread. So everybody wants to pay more and by the same dollar or same rupee, extra rupee. Then you can easily see that the cost of production has gone up. And if you do not change the number of people that you are employing, then there are additional costs because you are not optimally rehiring. So I am eliminating all those recalculations, but I'm saying that actually now, there is an increase in cost of production. Everybody loses profit. So let me draw that picture now. And this is Baker and Arrow conclusion. This is nothing me. So Baker and Arrow concludes and could conclude, although Baker and, Ar in Baker and Arrow, the market structure is very classical. So the farms, you know, all the farms are homogeneous, no problem. And if one farm pursues, discrimination, nobody else does. But in my case, the world is not so linear. Linear in the sense of uh, how do model socio-psychological reactions of entrepreneurs. It's essentially people are interested in discrimination and they, they try to discriminate. Means that profit curve will go down because for the same for the same level of efficiency, now you would earn lower profit. If you do that, then your profit curve, this is the optimal profit curve. I'm not distinguishing between these two. This is the optimal, this is, sorry. This is the actual profit curve because the optimal profit curve can be shed higher than this, but this, this is not my concern. What would happen? Common sense, my cost is increasing. Everybody is losing profit, but everybody losing profit does not mean that all of them would be able to stay on in the market because now you see that the number of farms which have to exit the market are this extra number ones because these people from zero to Z1 tilde originally were not there, but Z1 tilde to Z2 tilde now they have to 
go away from the market. That's why Baker and Arrow would say that actually, why these guys are going to, you know, distribute because they're they're losing their money. But my focus is only on Z2 tilde to one. These people, these funds, have discriminated. Although their profits are less, but they will survive in the market. And I will focus that more more specifically. Now, one thing that uh, this this result is even stronger because as more farms go out of the market, the market price will go up because the industry affected the holistic because the supply of industry will actually fall given demand and therefore the price will go up. So actually I can show that this profit card would actually not fall so much, but they will fall a little less. And in particular, the bigger farms, the more efficient farms, because bigger farms, the farms are producing higher output because they are more efficient. So they are bigger farms, they are more efficient farms, and they would be engaging in discrimination because they are just losing maybe some amount of profits. And you cannot eliminate them from the market. So if, you know, this childishly simple model has any value, so far as the empirical you know, outcome is concerned, then we should observe, or we should observe discrimination among bigger and efficient farms mostly, or there will be a lot of social media or different kind of complaint against bigger farms because they are discriminatory. In fact, in fact, this is a, there is a, a I'll, I'll come to that a little later. Just there is a BBC uh, news report in 2019. In fact, I've referred to that, which has an extensive discussion on that why most bigger and efficient firms practice discrimination. That is the name of the news. And I'm saying that very interestingly, I have one conclusion from this little simple story is that suppose now, you know, we, we go to the market to survey after all these things have happened. And I want to find out, you know, the efficiency of this market, productivity, the average productivity of the market before discrimination was there and after discrimination was there. Very interesting. The average productivity, remember this alpha that we, I said that this is a this is a measure of productivity of farms, this alpha, this alpha. So there are farms which are, let's say, you know, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, and so on. You know, as you move up, they are more efficient. Now, what has happened after discrimination that uh, more inefficient, you know, if you observe this one, you know, the first case is that there was no discrimination. Then you would observe that the, the farm will have these, these numbers of, uh, the, the market will have these numbers of farms, Z1 tilde to one. You can average them, you know, discrete average means suppose there are three farms, then it is Z1 plus Z2 plus Z3 divided by three, because these are the, it, this can be discrete numbers and the Z3 is greater than Z2 greater than Z1. Now what has happened, only Z2 and Z3 are surviving. Z1 has left. That means the average productivity has increased in the industry. So you would find that more productive is the industry, the extent of discrimination is greater. Because essentially, the bigger and more efficient farms would be able to sustain such discriminatory practice. So therefore, that's the reason there is a very paradoxical outcome that here are some farms which are discriminating. Here is an industry which is discriminating. And in the ultimate equilibrium, you observe that actually the average productivity of this farm is higher relative to non-discrimination. Not because, not because they are not, you know, they are treating the, 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 the female male workers the same way, but because essentially that by the same argument that was perceived by Baker and Arrow, the, we are qualifying that argument. Less efficient farms cannot sustain discrimination in a competitive market, but more efficient farms can. 
and the interesting part is is that that you know that it is it is important that you know i i would come to my my concluding remarks uh, you know which will be little elongated but i'll just tell you that uh, uh, when you go a little deeper into the market uh, structure issues and you and you think of a really imperfect product market where, where the big funds have control on prices then theoretically you can show that they can create even more of a problem for less efficient farms so if every farm starts discriminating then the less efficient farms is sure to go out and the more efficient farms can actually increase profits so in this model that i have shown you that some profit decline is 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 absorbed by the more efficient farms but there are two arguments which should take it in a, on a different plane one is more imperfect is the market the loss of profit would be less for them that is number one number two which is i think is an important issue that we should always remember whenever we try to relate a social psychological issue to the market uh, det market determined variables then you have to look at human behavior from a different perspective and this perspective is that certain types of individual behavior and entrepreneurs are not inorganic materials entrepreneurs in a male dominated society are actually male entrepreneurs entrepreneurs in a male dominated society even that society is far more non family oriented business are actually run by uh, uh, you know more sophisticated polished modern day businessmen but you find their grooming also has to affect their ways of discrimination you know it is not only you know that their 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 talent their gift to understand you know different types of uh, both academic and non academic uh, inputs but how they have been groomed in the family those are very important issues so the question i feel is that to be asked in this context that if i go by a uh, you know like an economist on an utilitarian uh, aspect then essentially the idea of discrimination like many other social uh, you know prejudices and prejudices affecting the real physical outcomes in the market which may be detrimental to those who are undertaking those prejudice driven behavior the utility actually is a function of both to what extent i can stick to my commitment i can stick to my conviction because i have talked to many brilliant academic and tried to you know you know in in a, in a sort of uh, very kind of friendly debate as to you know certain very simple things regarding casteism regarding you know racism and so on and my answers differ from them big time and they are very smart people so the question there i found that people have an intrinsic desire to stick to their commitment or conviction and also a desire to make sure that they are not materialistically losing out because of their conviction but these two have trade offs so it can be you know if i am an entrepreneur who is bitten by this bug of prejudices of discrimination i am a very smart entrepreneur i care about the business the profits the dividends but i also care about my internal logic you know kind of conviction that action a is superior to action b even if means some social uh, it has some social connotation then the question there is the loss that i suffer because that type of action is going to affect my profits or my whatever material benefits those two are balanced at a subjective plane by this individual because he wants to know or she wants to know or we want to know what price would you pay for being so socially prejudiced so that's the price that he is willing to pay so if i go back to this this diagram you know that is if i go back to this diagram you know essentially if i am located somewhere here and i am very prejudiced then what i would say is that well now you know i used to get let's say 100 dollars as profit 
Now I'm getting $60, you know, $50 or $70 as profit. But this is measuring, this $30 gap is measuring my willingness to pay for this peculiar mental, you know, kind of setup or mental mindset that I have. So this is a willingness to pay for your, you know, there is a literature on economics of status, you know, how people behave in, in, in a way that, you know, I buy a car when there was no car in my locality, I feel great. Now everybody else has a car and I buy a car, I always compare by saying why I'm not buying a more expensive car than him. I'm very unhappy. So the question is that, is it not right that when I did not have the car and I have got a car, there's an utility gain, I'm, I'm happy relative to that situation. But I'm happy because I was happy because nobody else has a car. But now my happiness is something different. Now, if somebody has studied economics in undergraduate or postgraduate, unfortunately, in the textbooks that I teach, then they will say, oh, my consumption has no, you know, your consumption has nothing to do with my consumption. But then you would be actually negating reality big time. So the question is, to what extent, you know, people might say, you know, I have heard that in Punjab, people are buying tractors. That's a social, you know, status indicator because they want to show, you know, how big farmer they are. Now, having a small piece of land, economically suggests that don't buy a tractor because, you know, fixed cost is high. You know, you need more piece of land to make it uh, feasible, operational, profitable. But I would buy a tractor nonetheless. People would say, oh, he's, he's a farmer who has a tractor. Now, that having a tractor is going to lose, you know, I'm going to lose my profit. But I can take that loss because somewhere in the social domain, I am gaining. In my socio-psychological domain, I am gaining. In fact, conspicuous consumption is a very rational choice. Now, experimental social psychologists are talking about that. They are there undertaking many social, you know, psychological experiments and suggesting that why people, they, they, they go for conspicuous consumption without having any need for that. And in fact, this has great implications for poverty, distribution, inequality, empowerment, and, and, and efficacy of government policies and so on. So I think, you know, just to uh, sort of uh, summarize, my basic point has been to contradict partially this conclusion that in a competitive equilibrium, discrimination cannot survive. And I have shown that that is not fully true. Second is, in fact, the, the, the result that I've shown that you have, you can have a situation where everything looks very fine. You know, you have an industry where there are big farms and they're very efficient and very productive, but that industry is also exhibiting a, a, a significant or a non-trivial degree of, 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 of discrimination. Kenneth Arrow in 1998, you know, he said that we have to have different theories because we do not know still which meant that in competitive industry, you know, discrimination persists. In fact, uh, Henry Wan, a very famous economist uh, of, 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 of yesteryears, but is very much productive now, is about 90, teaching at Cornell, a great friend. And he had a paper on Arrow's work uh, in, in celebrating Arrow's, Arrow's different types of work. And he quoted Arrow by saying, but that still it is there. If still it is there, then we have to think more about it. And uh, in fact, the last point I would like to make is that uh, we are working on, you know, uh, my friend, uh, Professor Reza Oladi from, from US and a PhD student of Calcutta University, uh, Shushobhan Mahata. We have a paper now in the making in which we take a long run holistic view of the economy of competitive capitalism. And there we, we we look at that other consequence, we show that a very ideal competitive system can move on and on and on, but capitalists would never care because capitalist return might not be affected and the capitalist would not you know, go to another industry or anything. And at the same time, there will be, con there will be decline in female wages and increase in, in male wages if you want to pursue this kind of discrimination. But no, you know, it's very interesting because without an efficiency difference, aggregate output in the society, aggregate employment in the society, the technological reach, everything would remain the same. But the female would get lower wage than the male. So basically, 
uh, that would be the the other part of my my our work and i thank again uh, the mids and uh, professor gopala swami professor babu and the rest of the folks uh, because i am a i think i am maybe a distant but i am still a part of mids in some capacity and i i really thank everyone who has uh, attended my talk and uh, you know and thank you very much Professor Babu, I think uh, uh, if uh, Professor Sugata Marjit is ready for a few questions, uh, are you, sir? Can yes, uh, sure. yes. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Professor Babu. You can uh, moderate. You can find out who are uh, uh, on the queue for asking questions. And uh... sir, you are on mute, sir. Uh, are there any uh, questions from the audience? And if you have, please raise your hands. Uh, yeah, Venkat, uh, please uh, go ahead. Please thank unmute you. yourself and ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay, thank yes, you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Sukata. It was an excellent uh, talk. Um, so my, I, I have some clarificatory question. Basically, I think that. Uh, Initially, you have been uh, talking about uh, the bounds on rationality, but I think that uh, that your model is uh, based on uh, unbounded rationality, where the producer, the laborers, all of them have full information about productivity, wage, and uh, the expected uh, benefits, profits in the market, right? But suppose, let us assume that there are bounds on rationality among these individuals. Take, for example, uh, the producer has no idea about uh, the productivity of individual laborers. He has only got the idea about, uh, you know, information about the average productivity. And uh, in this case, if uh, she still discriminates then uh, uh, that that would affect the productivity because uh, uh, sometimes you know the lower wage for higher productivity labor will eliminate this higher productivity labor and therefore she will end up with less profit similarly on the laborer side suppose they adopt a, a kind of uh, you know bounded rationality approach even with the discrimination, if they, have, if, if they have decided to continue in the labor market, continue with the same form, uh, then uh, you know, the outcome that you are talking about may not be a kind of a possible outcome. Take for example, the laborers may adopt a targeting approach rather than a maximizing approach. They may think that, look, even if the wage is low, it is satisfactory to me, right? So if that kind of boundarily rational assumptions are uh, kind of made behind this model, so how will this model work? Thank you. Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, I think I would agree that uh, with bounded rationality as you have defined, that is incomplete information about the type of workers, their productivity and so on, and also the laborers, uh, you know, although I have not modeled the uh, behavior of the workers in terms of how they are uh, looking at the wage or whether, you know, they are, uh, uh, what kind of uh, in, in, uh, reaction they will have uh, in terms of this wages and, and they, they also be misinformed and so on or incomplete information is there. Um, I have, uh, I agree with you that uh, the model that I have constructed does not have these elements. But now let me tell you what is the purpose of this model? Why I have built up this model? See, I am directly uh, comparing my result with the type of work that Barrow, uh, that Baker and Arrow has done or related, you know, related work in which they look at a very ideal competition, competitive system. No informational problem, nothing. 
So basically, it's a very mainstream, uh, you know, you know, sort of standard in class or classroom model of computation. Nothing more, nothing less. Sure. And there, they have tried to argue that competition may actually work as an antidote to discrimination. I am actually doing exact, almost exactly the same thing. So in a way, my purpose is defining the way I'm building up the model. So my model is incapable of handling these kind of anomalies or distortions very deliberately because I want to give a description of an ideal world, ideal competitive world, and still show that competition is not doing the doing what what it is supposed to do. Thank you. Uh, Vivek Jadav, uh, you had raised your hand. Can you please unmute yourself and ask the question? Vivek? Uh, hello, sir. Yes, uh, sir. Hello, sir. Uh, it's nice, nice to like see your presentation all the time. So, sir, I have two like two broad questions basically. So, let's say I have two market perfect competition market. In one market, let's say there are heterogeneous firm with one is uh, like comparably more efficient and other are not. So discriminative practices, the decline in profit, other firms couldn't survive and they left market and efficient market firm will survive. So in such a market, uh, first of all, should you call that a com perfect competitive market? And if it is a competitive market, then is there any threat for new entrant? Like new entrant can come up with anti-discriminative practice with higher profit and then then can to like break that barrier. And my second question is, let's say in a one market, if there are all efficient firms and after adopting the discriminatory practices, their profit get reduced and still they survive. So in that market, are you saying discriminative practices become, are coexisting with Pareto optimal condition? Like, so these are my two questions. Uh, can you repeat your second question again, please? So, so my second question is like, if there are all efficient firm in market, so are you saying that para optimal optimal solution still exists with discriminative practices? Uh, the first question that is, uh, if there is no entry barrier, then someone who's not discriminating can enter the market because because there is discrimination in this market and because of that, uh, there's a disadvantage that this, these firms have. Now, that would always be open to competition too. And, they, uh, and also you have suggested that this is, can we call it really a competitive market? Because essentially, in a very classical sense, the farm heterogeneity models are almost like, you know, competitive markets or farms have different technologies. Or, or it's like ownership or rent type of models. Now, technically speaking, it's not homogeneous farm model. So it's it's not 100% competition, that's true. That's why uh, what I wanted to uh, suggest uh, and the paper that I mentioned, that is here the only element of competition is coming that the farms are not big enough to affect the price, the commodity price in the market. So that is the, and we know that that is the major part of competitive attribute. But because the farms have different technologies, that's why these farms are more efficient. So from the same labor force, they can, they can do it. Now, there would be equilibria where I can show that actually, you know, that there may be other types of entry barriers where the farms will make sure that the new farms cannot come into the market. You know, that, that is the attribute of an imperfectly competitive market. And here also, all those who, who are able to produce these goods are summarized by this distribution of technology. So there is no other person. And another point is that my first assumption was very different from Baker and Arrow. I just said that intrinsically people love to discriminate. So I am taking this, that if you love to discriminate, what happens to the market? So this market 
is self contained in some sense nobody is there except this you know except these funds but if you go to even imperfectly competitive market where there is some sort of entry possible and so on and so forth they are also you can calculate the possibility that discrimination actually can raise the profit of of the firms which are discriminating because if if the other firms do not discriminate for example in the imperfectly competitive market female workers are getting the same wages wherever wherever they are going fine but the male worker is getting more in bigger and efficient firms you have to pay the male workers more that is the idea not less because the no male worker will come to you so so all of this are are taken are have to be modeled properly ours is the simplest story which does not address this but the last but not the least i'll tell you when all firms are competitive when the system is pareto optimal if all the firms symmetrically become discriminatory then that does not disturb pareto optimal because whatever discrimination disturbs is about the distribution between male and female workers and we know that in the utility function it is the individual because income distribution is not important so you see if the female worker have the same wage and the male worker gives little more it is it is it is not pareto suboptimal so even in a model where pareto optimality is maintained i can show which is not this model this is the one i am talking about that in fact there is a paper uh, which i have referred to uh, not referred to in this this paper is a there is a working paper now with reza waladi in which we show that even with uh, the standard competitive model with pareto optimality this act of discrimination where you actually just you know tamper with this uh, wage distribution a bit it gives you a different competitive equilibrium but that competitive equilibrium shares all the features of pareto optimality it's not a problem thank you yeah uh, there is just one more question in the yeah. chat box yeah uh, by uh, by uh, kamakshi uh, so this is on please throw light on intersectional gender discrimination and i think like intersectional they mean multiple uh, types of discrimination like by caste class marital status oh yes yes yeah. uh, no i am i am sorry that i am not uh, capable of answering uh, this in terms of this model but i am i am, i will still try to push the idea that uh, part of the policy for for containing or controlling gender discrimination is a policy of it's a, it's a you know can be an affirmative action or reservation or something but it is also a, has to be a policy of empowering people with true knowledge that is the fact is that that to understand you know why people are discriminating which this type of analysis do not address this type of analysis address in context of labor market very precisely that if there is discrimination what is the consequence if there is multiple discrimination suppose there is caste based discrimination there is gender based discrimination there be racial discrimination religious or whatever you know that these discriminations are not monotonically related so there may be gender discrimination increasing in some places even if there is not much of a caste discrimination somewhere the caste discrimination is showing up but they are male female both caste you know both both members of a of 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 so called lower caste are being discriminated so these these are case specific and context specific but it would be really very interesting to look at that if we have a multi kind of multi discrimination or intersection of discrimination and there is a singular discrimination then we talk about some sort of market structure characteristics whether that has different kind of a result you know i have not worked it out but hopefully someone may try to at least look at some of the empirical evidences on that would be great because then the question would be male female wage whether it is being countered informal sector is 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 a good place to start with because in the informal wage you can see a lot of lot of uh, interplay of of profit maximizing behavior of 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 entrepreneurs 
because there is not much of regulatory control of the government. And there you can look at the, the nature of this intersection of, 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 of this, you know, discrimination or intersection of these uh, different categories and look at you know, how that wage distribution is being affected by different kinds of, of discrimination, whether those distributional characteristics are varying between markets, between regions, between societies or, or whatever, but it's a great research idea. And I think uh, I'm sure that somebody must be doing it. The research ideas are not wasted these days. So somebody will be doing it, or if not, then I would definitely urge the social scientists present here, you know, to sort of give it a look and try to do something about it. Thank you. Uh, chairman has a question. Uh, okay, sure. I, I, Uh, very well presented, uh, Professor. Uh, it's a very in interesting uh, talk. Um, I have no comment on because I I, I am uh, I am totally ignorant of the theoretical underpinning of uh, these issues. But what I practically observe is something which I would like to uh, uh, mention a few words. Uh, this is about an industry with which uh, a friend of mine is involved, and um, I am part of his uh, team. <clears throat> And there's a cashew processing industry and uh, started around five years ago. Uh, what was observed was that it was in the rural area and the uh, productivity of the workers, both male and female, um, was different. I mean, uh, there were different levels of productivity, okay. But there was this minimum wages act because of which everybody had to be paid the same. Sure. Okay, so now, um, after much discussion, the managing director, uh, friend's uh, son, he devised a methodology. He started eliminating those workers who would not produce a particular level of production. Okay. And anybody who was uh, going beyond that, he gave them a bonus. Okay. So on one side, he was trying to bring up the productivity level, uh, average productivity level to a particular level, which he thought would uh, help him to make enough uh, profit. Uh, then in order to maximize his profit, he was um, providing certain incentive to those who would overstep that, over uh, do that. And so far it's been working reasonably well. So I don't know where in your theoretical calculations well, it's, it's it will very, fall. It's very <laughs> insightful. I, I must say that uh, that's very insightful because the role of use of the minimum wage has been discussed in the literature as sort of, you know, uh, a kind of uh, uh, trying to identify because minimum wage sometimes brings out the productivity effort on people. You know, it's like people, if they're paid a very low wage, at a minimum, higher minimum wage, there is an efficiency wage kind of an impact. People have argued that. But this type of evidence is there in the in the in the uh, in the international trade area. In particular, I also have experienced something like that when a market opened up for textiles in Bengal for uh, after economic reform and so on. Then you know the the local textile merchants previously they did not care about distinguishing between more efficient and less efficient workers, but now they found that. To be more, you know, profitable, you know, or, or compete in the rest of the world, they need more. I to identify more uh, profitable, you know, productive workers and so on. So now they put more effort to identify the, uh, you know, having this kind of productivity cutoff thing and so on, and treating them better, treating them better than the than the others, and and, and so when the market size expanded. This type of effort to identify who is more productive, who is less productive, became operational. When the market size is small, that never happens. So that is that is one type of thing. But that will have an impact in this model also, because as you can see, that uh, if you have to give, you know, if there is a relationship between productivity and wage, then giving higher wage can increase your productivity and increase your profits also. You know, there there are models of that. But uh, all depends, you know, the, the premise is that you are unaware of the productivity difference really. And so you do not know who is better, who is worse and so on. So you are trying to devise a method. This is, this is what your story is. In my case, the model is not so complicated. In my case, it is essentially 
as if all of them are good, but there is some, you know, kind of a bad omen that is going on in terms of paying. But that has an impact in this model. There is no doubt about that. There is an impact. And the impact is how effective would be competitive policy or regulatory policy and so on, depending on, on how, how, you know, whether the entrepreneur is more, is proactive in bringing on productivity difference and so on. So that I think it's a very relevant question, but my model is not answering the, the impact of that. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. So, like, uh, <clears throat> just like one quick remark with regard to uh, Vivek Jadav's question. Yeah. I think he seemed bothered about heterogeneity. I just wanted to point out to him uh, uh, that, like, look, like, you know, if you're thinking about uh, job search models and things like that, mm. if you need a wage distribution to begin with, somewhere some heterogeneity has to come into the model. Yes. Without that, like, we know from Peter Diamond, like, it will collapse. Into single wage, then there cannot be any search, right? That's so true. you want to search for a better wage, then you need a distribution, and for the distribution to exist, somewhere some heterogeneity has to come in, even in a, basically in a competitive setup, That's I guess. True. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, I think like uh, this is probably the we are right dot on time. Uh, so, may I ask, uh, uh, Prasanna, are you around? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Uh, Prasanna will give the vote of thanks. He's our publication officer. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll just be uh, brief with my vote of thanks. I'd like to thank our chairman, uh, Sri N. Gopalaswamy, for presiding over this event. I'd like to thank our director, Professor Babu, for initiating the planning and organization of this event weeks back and introducing us to the speaker, Professor Majid. I'd like to thank our special guest and speaker, Professor Sugata Majid, for delivering this Founders Day lecture in the most eloquent and lively manner possible. I thank the Leonard members of MADS academic community, the faculty and research scholars, and the participants for their engaging discussion post-lecture. My gratitude also goes to my colleagues, especially in the IT section, for efficiently managing this event online. I wish to acknowledge the media members, if they are present, for their participation as well. Thank you, each and everyone, for joining us. Good evening and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Aguto. Thanks. Hope to see you soon. Yeah, hope to see you soon too. <laughs> Let's see how quickly it can happen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. <laughs>